Well, hello and welcome. You are now listening and perhaps watching the next episode of the Spark Your Creative podcast. And I am your host, Sharon Burton, um, CEO, founder of Spark Your Creative Coaching. And um, very happy to be with you for another edition. And we are moving through our latest series, which is In the Flow, Creating um, Over 40. And I've had some wonderful guests that have shared with me um, during the last few months some wonderful stories and inspiration about how they stay creative. And hopefully this series is helpful to you, the listener, who may be interested in pursuing a creative career or a creative endeavor and think that you're, that is too late to do that. And we are, or at least my guests anyway, are demonstrating that it's never too late to be what you might have been. So just keep that in mind. And hopefully um, one of these stories, if not all, have been inspirational to you. Well, I want to introduce a very extra special guest. <laughs> um, and it it dawned on me one day when I was having dinner with her that, you know, I need to have you on the podcast. Um, this woman is someone that is very inspirational to me, motivational and all kinds of different stuff. I just had the pleasure of meeting her during the pandemic in, I believe, 2021 or 2020. But anyway, by accident. And it's been a pure delight to be with this woman. We hang out. We we do art days. Um, some of you might have heard about her through me. I do reference her uh, at different times on my social media and on Facebook. And if you follow me closely, um, I talk about this person and I, I consider her uh, who I want to be. I want to be like when I grow up. And her name is Sandra Wilson, Dr. Sandra Wilson. She is my cousin. And uh, I was so excited that she had agreed to be on the podcast today because she's going to be sharing her story and her a little bit about um, how she stays creative in, in her golden years. And we all want to get to our golden years and she is there and she is thriving, you hear me? She is thriving as um, a multi-dynamic um, artist and creative. And I thought that she would be very inspirational for those of you that are listening or watching. So um, I'm going to introduce her and share a little bit about her. Uh, I had to kind of work with her bio because she has so much going on. So hopefully I will do her justice for, to, for this program. Dr. Sandra Wilson is a retired elementary school teacher, teacher supervisor, and college professor. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Elementary Education from Cheney University of Pennsylvania, followed by not one, but two masters. She has one in education from Montclair University in education and one in humanities with a concentration in fine arts from Beaver College. She received her PhD in interdisciplinary urban education with a minor in communication. So she is, as my dad used to say, heavy. <laughs> um, she has held positions with local organizations that focus, focus on education and social justice issues and served as a member of the board of directors for the Settlement School of Music. She is a published writer of poetry, prose, plays, fiction, and an award-winning painter having participated in numerous exhibitions with one painting uh, that was displayed in the African-American Museum in Philadelphia. She is also musical. She's an enthusiastic piano player. And her play, We Are, was published in the International Journal of Black Drama at Temple University while she was working on her PhD. As my dad says, she's heavy, all right? She is presently completing a book and is ready to take that step into finding a publisher. So we're, both of us are actually on this whole track with uh, writing books right now and getting that to the finish line. 
Um, some of her stories have been published in anthologies and journals. She has two adult children and a host of grandchildren and lives in Maryland. So I just want to present to you, Dr. Sandra Wilson. Thank you for being on the Spark Your Creative podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. So our topic today is staying creative in your golden years. And many of us that are at midlife know that our next step is our golden years. And I want to, to really illustrate today how uh, creatively thriving that can be, that stage of life. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, with you um, about uh, your current creative journey, but just how did you get started with all of this arts and writing and poetry and all that kind of stuff? And, and what has been your inspiration? Well, it was never uh, uh, mandated that I would be interested in something like that. It started really as a child. Um, I'm one of those children of um, before integration started, before G Brown versus the Board of Ed. And so, you know, times were very different from the way that they are now, though it seems like we might be heading back that way again, unfortunately. But um, I was the kid in the, in, in the classroom, uh, there were two of us, in fact, that evidently could draw. And so when the other children had a problem, they would come to me and say, could you draw this cat for me? Or could you draw this dog for me? But I never, it's not anything that I ever really, you know, thought about. I remember in, in first grade, my mother came home from, it was my first report card and parent conferences and she came in and I was waiting for her. And she said, um, I said, well, how did I do? You know, what was my report card? And she said, oh, you did wonderfully. You got all ages, all highs. That's fantastic. So I felt calm and very happy about that. And then maybe about a half an hour later, she came in and she says, why do you talk so much in school? <laughs> oh, you know, I, you know, as a at first grader, I'm like, what do you mean? She said, you know, when you get finished your work, because you get finished your work before the other kids do, you can't go over there and talk to them because they're still doing their work and it's not fair. So what we decided to do is we're going to, between the teacher and I, we're going to have some things for you to do when you finish your work so that you are not going to be talking to those kids and they can learn their lessons. So um, I remember she bought, um, it was uh, these little shapes like triangles and rectangles and circles and, and they were adhesive and I could take them and make all kinds of pictures and I started to kind of create with them. And I remember that being something that I really, really enjoyed. And I've never thought about it again, but as time went on, um, you know, when we, when I was little, um, my pet, my grandparents were the first people around who got a television set. And it was a huge box with a little tiny round picture like that. Before that, we would sit and listen to the radio. Um, but on Sunday mornings, the newspapers would come and they would have the funnies in them. So I would take the funnies and lay them out on the floor. And on the radio, they would read the funny. So I would read along with them. This was before I went to school. And it helped me learn how, you know, with my reading. And then uh, when television came along, you could actually see them with the funnies. So I would take my, my um, paper and I would draw along with the funnies as they were reading them. And then when my grandfather would read books to me, well, he would have books there for me and he would tell me the stories. And I thought he was reading them but he had never gone to school to learn how to read because he had to work on the farm. So I would create these characters in my mind and I would create these. So that must have been the beginning of that and the reading of the books. Um, the creative writing thing came in high school. Uh, I was, uh, I was, I guess Brown versus the Board of Education happy, happened just before when I was in fifth grade. And so it, the integration took place and some things happened. And well, when I went to high school, they, you could be an academic course, you could be in junior business training, you could be in, in uh, general course. And I was placed in junior business training, but my father was a custodian. 
in one of the schools and he went to the principal and said, we want her in academics. And she called over and switched it. One of the classes was creative writing. So I was the only black class kid in that creative writing class. And so the teacher would always give me a C on my creative writing. And one day I had to write a story. I, I, said, I volunteered to write a story for one of the other girls in the class because she had been sick and she got an A in the class and I wrote the story. So it made me begin to think, well, there's something wrong, you know, here. And so I just continued to write and, and love writing and finally found out that one of my stories was placed in <clears throat> the high school literature book that they wrote, which was really something new and different at that particular time. So I think that that those things begin to gel. However, there never came a time when I felt that I could be an artist. It just wasn't in my realm of thinking or my parents' realm of thinking. At that time, if you wanted to go to college, you were going to be a teacher, a nurse, or a social worker, right? So teaching really allowed me to express myself artistically because I would drive some of the teachers wild with the bulletin boards that I created. So it was it was not fun for them. <laughs> it was fun for me. So teaching really allowed me to express myself um, creatively in writing and music because I always had a piano in the room and um, and, and and drawing. And so I taught a lot of things through art, actually. For instance, taking a a, a lesson in mathematics. How would you do a mathematic lesson? through art. Well, you give the kids a graham cracker. Then you have them draw the graham cracker, right? Then you'd see that the graham cracker breaks up into fractions. Then they eat a piece of the graham cracker. And then they erase that piece that they, you know, until they understand what fractions would be like, right? So you can teach through art. You can just teach any of the, the subjects. Uh, because in elementary school, you teach it all. So those kinds of things allowed me to express my, myself artistically. Or if it was the Chinese New Year, I might draw on, on um, the, the brown bag paper, a huge um, dragon and divide it into spaces. And so I thought about the children who would get finished their work first. They could come over, pick a space, and they could design one part of the dragon. So by the end of the, the, uh, the week or so, you have a full dragon that the kids had basically designed. All I had to do was outline it in black and they had uh, something for the bulletin board. So you could do science that, draw butterflies, the insects, the shapes of them, all of those kinds of things. So that was really my early encouragement of art. But then I got married, moved into my own house, wanted to decorate, didn't have a lot of money. Teachers are not wealthy. Um, so I painted pictures to put on the wall. I made, uh, I started sewing and made uh, draperies and bedspreads and they turned out nicely, but everything else was terrible. My sewing is not good. So it started me painting and people would see the work and they'd say, you know, this is good. You should do something with this. And so it began, that's how it kind of all began. And then one day, my husband and I were coming home, and we couldn't get through Jenkintown. It was boarded off because they had 100 artists out there that were sh showing their work, all kinds of art, glass art, you know, anything that you could possibly think of. And I said, I'm going to get in this show. So I painted three pictures, and I went to the judging, and I thought, oh, my God, if they don't pick this, I'm going to be very upset, you know. And I, I got rejected. So I cried all the way home. This is a story I always tell my students. I said, I'm not going to let them beat me. I'm coming back next year. I'll have three pictures that are better than the ones that they saw. And I did. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what if I get rejected again? How am I going to handle that? So I sat there. And this time, an art of one of the judges came out. And he said, you know, you have some talent, but you need to take some classes in drawing or something. It's just a little something missing. So I cried all the way home. I was rejected the second time. 
I said, I'm not going to give up. So I, that's how I got into the second uh, master's degree. I started taking some classes. And um, I knew that Jack Davis was the head of the department at Beaver, and he was a renowned artist. And I had so many, taken so many classes that eventually I got another master's degree, which I really wasn't interested in. And that led to writing also, which, which helped with this play being published. But anyway, so I go back the third year and I said, now, look, if you rejected this third year, you are not coming back, right? So I got there and I got accepted in the show. I was the only Black artist in the show. And I won third place in painting. So my painting was placed in Bloomingdale's. And from that show, I began to get other shows, independent shows and banks and different places like that. So now I'm revved up, you know, and I'm really ready to roll. So that's, that's how it all really came to fruition. Now that part about, you know, submitting your work and all that, Roughly, how old were you when that when you started kind of yeah. getting involved in starting that um, that second master's degree with the art? And I think classes? that was maybe thirty five, something like that. Okay. In my thirty. So, I think it's important people know that because you know, though you've always been artistic, maybe not so much with the visual, but definitely with the writing. Right. Um, you didn't get started really exhibiting work and everything. You know, you did some things around the house, but um, I think it's there's, it's noted, it's something to note that your confidence that, you know, you didn't know anything about this exhibition. And, and this was out of Philadelphia, correct? Yeah, right yeah. outside of Philadelphia. The, it was in Jenkintown, you know, one of the, okay. like a little quaint uh, area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, I think it's something for people to kind of know that, you know, you can start late and mm -hmm. still do well, you know, mm -hmm. and though you weren't over 40, you know, you weren't, a, you know, this teenager doing all this or even in your 20s, you know, this was later and you were, you know, have already got your master's, you had a career in education, um, you, you're raising kids and you're married and all that kind of stuff. And here you are submitting for something and having the tenacity and the interest in doing that. I just think there's just so much to be said about that. So, um, and it's funny because ironically, it was um, about the same age that I um, started pursuing my visual art career. Mm -hmm. um, by uh, showing my work by the time I was 40, but starting around 35, 36, just creating and and just, you know, trying to figure out what my, how I was going to show up as a visual artist. So, you know, we see folks, we have a lot in common. The DNA is just strong with us. Okay, so what do you do to stay creative now? You know, you're retired, the kids are grown. It's just, you know, you're hanging out and having, living your best life. <laughs> I am. <laughs> stay really creative. Happy. And, you know, what inspires you now is the same. You had mentioned education and working education kind of helped you with a lot of that. But what inspires you now and how do you stay creative now? Well, you know, I look back and I think about um, what has happened, but I don't say looking back. I stay in the present, right? Looking toward the future. So when I look back, um, when I graduated from Beaver, which is Arcadia now, the to get the master's degree, you had to write, oh, you had to do something artistic, right? So you could paint a picture, you could create a musical piece and present it. Um, so what I decided to do is to, I thought I was going to, to paint something, is to write this play, this three-act play. So I wrote the play, that was my thesis, right? And, and I got an A on it, so, you know, it, it was fine. Later on, when I'm working on my doctorate, I took a course. In, um, in black theater. 
Afrocentric theater. And the uh, teacher was from the Middle East. And she said, you know, I like your writing. She said, have you thought about writing a play? Because we're getting ready to, to publish this, um, this, this periodical. And uh, Malafi Asante, who was the head of the Black Studies Department at Temple at the time, Charles Fuller, who wrote A Soldier Story, and a few other people were involved in the judging of the, the work. So I said, oh, sure, I'll do this. And I forgot all about it. They're not going to accept my, you know, this is just. So I said, look, it's a three act play. She said, well, we only want one act. So I said, well, each act is one into itself. The day before they were due in, she said, well, I didn't see your work. Are you, send it to me. Would you please send it to me? And I did. And that's how. And that sparked something in me about being able to write. So now I'm 79 years old and I moved down here when I was 75 into Maryland. Maryland has a fantastic program for the senior citizens, right? Now, Maryland is interesting because uh, my, like my accountant said, if you move to Maryland, they do tax your retirement. But they have such a great program for senior citizens that it's kind of worth it to me. So once I got down here, I said, I'm going to take, you know, some line dancing. I'm going to take some Zumba, you know, and uh, and I did that. And then I found out that they had creative writing and then they had autobiographical writing and they had painting. And so I began to paint. And I, I was lucky uh, to get into a painting class of people that knew how to paint already, who had had some success, or some people who were really wanted to learn and have done excellent from the time that they started. I got in a creative writing class with people who one woman had, she while she was we were in the class during COVID, they won an Academy Award for um, a documentary that they did on black signing. Another person in there is a uh, retired newscaster, uh, news reporter for one of the major stations. I think it was CNN, but I'm not sure, or C-SPAN, something like that. So these people were literally writers and they were working at their professions. Um, so it was not like, I wanna write a little story and I wanna learn how to write. It wasn't. It wasn't like that. So I jumped right in um, one of those classes. And I always tell um, the teacher, I tell Susan Moyer, I didn't really want to take this class. I just thought I wasn't going to be able to get into painting. So I needed to take another class. And the thing about it is that the classes are established by one of the institutions of higher learning. And so that motivates me. So we encourage each other. And we listen to each other and we critique each other. And so it has really motivated me to really want to, to write something. So I've been writing and sending things out and have been getting published and those kinds of things. So when my, you have to be, when my husband passed away in 2000, that's 23 years ago, I started writing a book about being a widow. Well, who wants to read a book about being a widow? Nobody wants to read that. So um, I had to find some ways to make it readable, funny, something that people could connect with. And so I tied it into dating, you know, online dating, offline dating, and the comparisons. So the things that were happening to me as a widow, how people began to treat me differently from when I was married, you know? And sometimes widows are, are not invited to anything anymore, you know, where they were invited to, when they were a couple, those kinds of people cut you out. But people, you know, you wouldn't know that until you go through that kind of thing, you know? And so I began to write this book and I still have it. And I, I put it aside and I, I only went to see fun movies, things that made me laugh for at least two years. And it really pulled me out of being in a, in a humdrum thing. So I find that creativity is really the essence of peace of mind, right? So when people started to say, well, we're going to take Jim 
away from the kids, you know, and we're going to take art. They don't need to have music class. And they don't understand that that all of that is a part of educating children. You know, um, when I first started teaching, I, I, I was my first class was in third teaching third grade, and I had to teach cursive writing. Well, they don't teach cursive writing anymore. Cursive writing is artistic if you look at it when you do it well. I, uh, I at that time I fell and dislocated my right shoulder, and I had to learn how to teach cursive writing with my with my left hand. And so the flow of these things, and if you pay attention to, I begin to pay attention to what was going on in the world outside, you know, uh, when they have the insects that come periodically or uh, a storm, like the hail that hit the other day, I had to go outside and kind of look at it because I don't know where I'm going to use that somewhere. And so I store all of that stuff. Um, one of the things about living today that's great to me is this phone, um, I leave it on my bed at night, you know. And so what happens is sometimes at night you start to think about things that you wouldn't normally think about during the day because you have so many things to do. And so I just speak it into my phone under ideas to write about. Because you, if you don't, you will lose those ideas. You will forget what you thought about. And some of your stories, you'll be surprised. Well, you know, if you tell me one thing, I have a story for it. Something that I saw, something that happened, you know, it's, uh, and they're interesting stories. They're not stories that, you know, you're going to sit there and bore somebody about. But um, it's, so, it's so much to write about. And plus, at this stage of my life, I want to leave a legacy for my children. So uh, when when you're an African-American of my age, most of the time, your parents and grandparents didn't tell you about their lives, right? So I feel it's up to me to make sure that I leave a legacy of information here for my children. And I will attest to um, Dr. Wilson's uh, comment. She can tell a story. And now whether it's fiction or nonfiction, she gets into it. And I mean, and I, she... The, the one thing I just love about her, you know, and we we have this type of relationship, which I have always wanted with someone who can kind of serve as a mentor to me, but also that I can listen and hear back. We'll, we'll share stories, artwork, you know, she'll call me and say, I want you to listen to this. What do you think? And her stories are so interesting because she has such a interesting beginning that pulls you into the story, but then it ends at such an interesting note that you just sort of like, well, what happened? <laughs> you know, it's, um, I don't know. It's, 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 you know, we have a lot of fun together, but she is a, to me, a master storyteller. And it's not many people that have that sort of natural gift to just tell a story without sounding like they're trying too hard. And then her poetry is just out of this world. She has been uh, inspiration and, and a, indirectly a mentor to me uh, for my poetry. So, um, you know, she's a prolific writer as well as um, a visual artist. And as someone who took classes and learned later in life, you know, it's it's been fascinating to see her work and see how accomplished she is. We've been, uh, I've been fortunate to be in a couple um, exhibitions um, in the Maryland area, um, I've been uh, kind of, you know, she's done a lot of work in, uh, shown a lot in the Philadelphia area. And I said, well, you're in Maryland now, we're gonna get you out here. And so we've been, and I've been sharing calls for art and she's getting in them. And recently we were, uh, well, we were in a, at the time of this recording in, in an exhibition together. And I mean, they just straight up kind of ignored my work. And I mean, they they put in the little pamphlet the little, for the reception, y'all. They put her work in there along with some others. And I said, oh, I guess she's like the, one of the superstars in this show. <laughs> anyway, but, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate you sharing, um, you know, your story and some of the things that inspire you. I think as artists, we tend to be more aware of our surroundings. We're empathic. We see things, we connect with nature, we connect with things around us, and it helps us to be inspired. It could be something somebody says that might, I'll put down for a poem, you know, or, you know, 
I, I just recently got a book of um, African-American uh, collage artists and I'm looking through that for my birthday, um, looking through that and getting ideas. So those are things that, you know, I think a lot of us as artists, you know, we tend to be very aware of our surroundings. Now, I have two more questions. One is, what would you say is the advantage of maintaining a creative practice at this time of your life? Um, you know, compared to maybe, oh, 20, 30, even 40 years ago. Well, it's, it's interesting how people uh, react to you as you get older, you know. Um, I am enjoying this age. I mean, I really am. There is a respect that you garner if you allow that respect to be there. I mean, some, you know, some people get older and they get grumpy. I can say what I want to say. I don't care what you think, you know, I've been lived this life, you know. But uh, to really totally enjoy the times that you go through. I remember um one of the artists said um something about getting to this stage of life where you're getting ready to die and how it's like an experience, you know? Um, and I find that to be so. And I think that I think of myself now, this is kind of, this might be a little selfish, but I think of myself as a griot, right? Because as, um, as a younger person, I was into, you know, black power to the people, um, you know, I was into that hippie stage at one time and, and, uh, and, and then I was into, you know, studying and, and, and doing Kwanzaa. I was in the newspaper. I was the Kwanzaa, you know, person. And, and so I think of myself as a griot and I respect griots. Griots were the, um, the Africans who would go from tribe to tribe and they would bring, they would, people would they would they would make noises or drum sounds to let the next group, the next tribe know that the griot was on the way. And the griot would tell stories, you know, and people would sit around. This was their entertainment. And, and the griot would not only just tell stories, but he, the griot knew the history of the people. So all they had to be really smart because they had to know the history of all of the tribes that they were visiting. And so I feel that I have to tell these stories. Um, whether they are historical fiction, historical fiction, poetic, theatrical, or whatever, that there's stories that need to be told. And if they're told or are written in a way that's interesting, for instance, the book that I'm, I'm finishing up now, it's really finished. I'm just, I, I decided I didn't want it to be just pages of writing. So since I'm an artist and I paint, I'm adding those things into, it's almost like a, a picture book for adults, right? With the stories, because my paintings, you know, they coincide with some of the things that I'm writing about. You know, they, they kind of just match in there. And I don't know, I, I'm not doing that intentionally. You know, it just so happens that, for instance, I know that I'm looking right now at turtles, okay? Um, I love I love animals anyway. So I'm looking at turtles and I, I see that because of the environment, the turtles are washing ashore. When they're supposed to be in the southern part of the country, they're now in the northern part of the country. And so therefore they can't get back to the water because they need to be where it's, you know, it's a mess. It's, so I'm looking at animals are that have become um this instinct, it, they're no longer here. So I don't want that to happen to the turtles. So I'm thinking of another, the next painting as doing something that has to do with turtles, right? How that's going to come out, I have no idea. But, uh, and, and that's what I'm saying. Sometimes you have these wonderful thoughts and you think that it's trivia and it's really, really not. You know, for instance, I had, um, when I was a kid and some people do this, they have continuing stories or they might, have the same dream over and over again, you know? So uh, what did I do? I put this dream that I had into a story form and created a mystery, a mystery story, you know, that, uh, that people could probably relate to because they've had similar experiences and never really thought about them anymore. But each person has some interesting things that 
that uh, happened to them. But sometimes we get so involved in other things that we don't concentrate on what's going on in here, right? And I think that seems to be the advantage of getting older and not having to balance so much in your life. You know, with, you know, your kids are grown, you're retired. So you can really kind of get into your creativity more in so many ways, you know. In a way, but sometimes the your 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 responsibilities are different. In mm. there, they're just different, right? Okay. Now your health begins to fail. You know, so you um, have that piece, yeah. You have all of those things to deal with. Are you going to, are you going to be stressed out because your hair begins to thin, right? Or your t- your tooth comes out, right? Or you have arthritis. I used to wonder why, every time I talked to an old person, all they talked about was, oh, my leg hurts. <laughs> oh, so died, you know. And I'm just, it's just, it's just miserable, right? These things will happen, right? Mm-hmm. But the concentrating on them does not make it better. So right. think about some things that are interesting. It will give you peace of mind and it keeps you from worrying so much. Um, I have con- come to the conclusion, you know, nobody's getting out of here alive. So why am I going to sit around and worry about that when I could be doing something that I enjoy that other people would enjoy also? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and enjoy, we do. Uh, (laughs) My last question is, um, what advice would you give people who think it's too late to have a creative life? Um, Whether they're your age, if they're mine, I just turned uh, 55, Um, you know, or even, you know, 45. What would you say to them about you know, them thinking, oh, it's too late, or I can't, you know, I was told, and just like you told, you said your, your teacher gave you C's, you know, in class, and that could have just stopped everything there, and I know some people, some clients that have told me, you know, a teacher said something to them in grade school, and didn't recognize their talents, and they just stopped, and they, they have a fear of starting that again, because someone said, they weren't good. So what, what would you be your advice to people that are in any of those situations? As long as you're breathing, it's never too late. You just have mm-hmm. to find something that you're talented in, that you have a gift for, or that you have a yearning for. If you can't sing, don't try to do that. You know, you, you're tone deaf. You, you're not going to be able to sing. So don't fool yourself because you're going to hurt yourself that way. But find something that, you know, that you're, you're gifted with. I think that um, one of the, and you have to, you can't allow other people to burden you with their, their perspectives all the time. When, um, when I was going to, to be, you know, to college and I had to go in for my interview and we're sitting there with the Dean, um, uh, and he's going through some things and he says, oh, you're, you're Walton, you're, you know, you're, you're, are you Fred's sister? Oh, n- no. N- oh, we expect wonderful things. Cause you know, you're his niece and so, so forth and so on. Then he looks in and he finds that my transcript has not been sent from the from the high school because the the, the high school um, uh, guidance counselor told my parents that I wasn't college material. And so there's no need to send me to college. I should get, you know, um, a job or something. And come to find out he had done that for other people, too. It, I wasn't just the only one. I was the only one that year that he had said this to. Wasn't that many of us there anyway. But he looked at my SAT scores and he says, okay, so you're from, you you went to Abington School District. He said, we don't have, they don't have, they haven't sent you transcripts, but your SAT scores are fantastic. So we're going to accept you on these SAT scores and maybe the transcripts will come in. And if not, you are accepted. Now, suppose I had gotten to the point where I said, well, I'm not, I'm not college material. So therefore, why should I even pursue this? And so I think as, as an older person, I can't, there's a guy in my class, he could not paint, he really couldn't. He was not good at it, he was not good. I wish you could see what this man is doing now. It is excellent. I mean, it is his own style. It's something that he loved doing and he wanted to try to do it. And so he kept on and he's, 
he I'm impressed. I told I said I am impressed with this and I'm not easily impressed. So I would say that, you know, as long as you have breath in your body and you have the ability to do something, um, and if you if you think that you can sing and you're tone deaf, sing to yourself. Sing in the bathroom or something. Just don't sing for other people because you don't want to hear it. But <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think, you know, find something that you like to do. Don't do it because Susie Jane is doing it. Do it because it's something that you feel that you would like, you, you would like to try. It. Try it and see. You know, give it a try. I think that's the key is trying. You know, nobody's expecting you to cut a record. No one's expecting you to do Carnegie Hall. No one's expecting you to be at the local museum. Mm -hmm. But if you have um, dreams that you were not able to do earlier in life, the second half is, is designed for you to do whatever you feel that is in your heart to do. And, and, and Dr. Wilson here is a testament of that because you know she's done a lot of very interesting and inspirational things um, as a creative and as a, as a multi-passionate creative because she doesn't just keep herself in one silo, which has been encouraging for me to really do more with my poetry and everything because for a long time I was just a visual artist and that was it. And you know, it's always a good thing when you see people thrive and do more than one thing and do it well, you know? Um, so I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Andrew Wilson, for being my guest on the podcast. Um, I appreciate you sharing um, your story. And I hope that those that are listening um, are feeling the same way that I do about her and about some of the things that she has shared. Um, and hopefully that will inspire you to move forward with your creative greatness. If you need a little bit of help with that, of course, I am here to help you. And you can reach me at www.sparkyourcreative.com. And if you like the podcast or the video, I suggest that you save it, share it, give me some feedback, and let me know what really, really interests you. What were some key points that you felt was um, uh, something that you will keep in mind for the future. I look forward to the next episode and thank you so much for your continued support and take care and stay creative. Bye-bye.